Let me tell you something. God doesn't do miracles just to show off. He does the supernatural so that his name will be known. And they say, who in the world is this? See, because too many of us still got him in a manger somewhere. See, too many of us don't, don't know who we're dealing with here. Who then is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. It doesn't work. This religious thing, this Christian thing, it doesn't work. That's what the disciples are saying. It's not working. I'm not getting victory. I'm not being delivered. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. It's not working. And I try and they want to know why. He doesn't just bless you for you. He blesses you for his name, his glory, your impact, your testimony, your ministry. God just doesn't want to do miracles that exclude you. He wants to do miracles that include you. You are part of the miracle. Jesus has been teaching all day. He's been teaching the crowds, preaching the big sermon, and then he takes his disciples aside and he gives them a private word. He says in verse 33 of Mark 4, with many such parables, he was speaking the word to them so far as they were able to hear it. And he did not speak to them without a parable but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. So he calls his disciples aside after teaching the big crowd and says, let me speak to you and let me give you some stories that will give you spiritual truth for you to apply to your life. And he gave them some inside information. Beginning in verse 35, he tells his disciples, I want you to get on the boat. And let us go, verse 35 says, to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat just as he was and the other boats were with him. So let's get something straight as we start our journey. The disciples are smack dab in the will of God. Jesus said, get in the boat. They got in the boat after the sermon. They listened to the word. He said, get in the boat. They got in the boat. And they are doing exactly what they were told to do. They are perfectly situated. Not only are they in the will of God, Jesus is in there with them. Because it says Jesus got in the boat too. So it, life can't be better than having church, hearing the word, and Jesus joins you in the boat. So Jesus is in the boat. They're going their way over to the other side. But while in the will of God and on the boat with the Lord, there's a problem. The problem is described in verse 37. There arose a fierce gale of wind and the waves were breaking over the boat so that the boat was already filling up. Now, many of these are professional fishermen, so they know how to handle water, boats, and storms. So when professional fishermen get scared, you know it's a big deal. This is a major lilac. And so they are caught in the storm while being in the will of God. So the first thing that you need to know is that in the will of God, it does rain. What tells you whether you're in a God, out of God's will is did you do what he told you to do? But whether you did it or you didn't do it, you can still be in a lilac. That is a tumultuous situation. The other thing you need to know about this lilac is it's merciless. That is, it comes down on you and it seeks to consume you. The boat was filling up. The wind was blowing at such speed that it threatened to take them under. Anybody ever been in a situation that looked like it was going to take you under? that it was going to drown you, that it was going to overwhelm you. A storm, this kind of trial, is an unexpected circumstance that invades your life, that threatens your very existence. We're not talking about a headache or a toothache here. We're talking about a situation 
where your life is on the line, where you don't know if you're going to make it or not. But let me tell you something else about a storm. A storm is always designed to increase your faith and give you a deeper experience with your God. Storms aren't pleasant, they aren't comfortable, and sometimes they can be life-threatening, but they always come with a purpose. So here they are in a crisis. They're in this crisis, and the crisis was threefold. There are actually three storms occurring here. Let me walk you through the three storms. First of all, there is a circumstantial storm, the lilac. I'll say one more thing about this circumstantial storm, and that is it was a storm over which they could exercise no control. You can't control the wind. You can't control the sea. You can't control the rain. You can't control the, the spinning of the turmoil. You can't control waves billowing up and going. You can't control that. That is out of your control. So you can be in the will of God and in a storm and absolutely be able to do nothing about it because you can't control a lilac. It's circumstances that produces a helpless and sometimes the feeling of a hopeless scenario. So that's storm number one. That leads to storm number two. Storm number two is that they were terrified. We know that they were terrified because Jesus is going to say to them, why are you afraid in verse 40? So they weren't scared, they were stirred. Now we're talking terrified. So now we not only have a storm of circumstance, we have a storm of emotion. Because their emotions have riveted up and they are scared about the doctor's report, scared about the financial struggle, scared about the, the relationship direction, scared, whatever it is that you can't control that's causing your emotions to be uprooted is your lilac. Because it's something so big, so deep, and so devastating, you can't control it. So the first storm are circumstances out of their control. The second storm is their emotional instability because of the uncontrollable circumstance. But there's a third storm here. We'll call it a theological storm. Because not only was their circumstance out of control, and now their emotions responding to their circumstance, they now have a spiritual storm a theological storm because the scripture goes on to say that they woke up Jesus and said in verse 38, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? See, that's a spiritual storm. Because their circumstances were out of control and their emotions have gone crazy, now they question whether what they have been believing is true. If the truth be told, and you would tell the truth and shame the devil, there aren't many of us who haven't questioned God, who haven't said, I'm not sure I should be believing this anymore. I'm not sure I could, should be continuing this. Because what I'm hearing on Sunday and what I'm experiencing on Monday don't match. I, I heard the preacher say that you care. <laughs> I don't see you caring for me. So what I heard about you and what I'm experiencing don't match and I'm not sure this is real. Because verse 38 says, Jesus himself was in the stern asleep on the cushion. They, they, they shook him and they said, don't you care? Because if you cared, we wouldn't even, have, even if you were tired, we wouldn't have to wake you up. You got you getting wet like we getting wet. The boat's flipping and flopping you like it's flipping and flopping us. And so they're in this storm. They're struggling. Jesus is asleep. And they had a question. Where were you? Do you, you don't care about me. If you cared about me, I wouldn't go be going through this like this. Don't you care how bad was it that we are perishing? So this is major. We think we're going to drown out here and die. I'm going to die. 
Jesus had just taught the disciples. They'd just come from church, so to speak. And now they're under pressure. And it's tough. Does Jesus care about my pain, my finances, my loneliness, my hurt, my, my depression? Because I'm in his will and I feel all this. And so, they wake Jesus up. Verse 39, Jesus gets up and he rebukes the wind and says to the sea, hush your fuss. Hush, be still. What I got from my father was, first of all, the example. Uh, he was a tremendous example because he was living what he preached and taught. So that example. I also got the powerful value of the Word of God, how powerfully valuable and how it took first place over everything. I mean, everything was to be judged, everything was to be managed by, everything was to be viewed through the Word of God. Now, so I think my view of Scripture and my view of the Word, the inerrancy of the Word, the power of the Word, the accuracy of the Word, the supremacy of the Word, all of that came from, from my father and he just learned it as a layperson. So I just uh, guess the word is the dominant thing. Don't forget, Peter was a lay person too, but he lived <laughs> 3,000 and 5,000 to Christ. Right. You see, so that was you. On, we can't put him on the same seat with, with Paul and the policy. We're very educated. But, but, but Peter, Peter was a fisherman. Right. And the Lord used him. And the Lord uses you. And he has used you. And, and how you got where you are today, only the Lord knows. You worked on the waterfront. Yeah, well, that's where I made my living and whatnot. And so some days we didn't work very much, but I did other things too to try to raise my family up, you know. I don't eat fish. Oh, yeah, well, that's, that's something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, but there's a reason I don't eat fish. And uh, you ate some of them, didn't you? Well, I ate them because I had to. Well, that's all we had. And they got all these little bones in them. Yeah, herring has. Sometimes I only work one or two. Two, two days I had to go down to the unemployment office for my family to survive and whatnot. So we've come a long ways. And you met my mother, your wife, who's now gone home, but... She's going to be with the Lord. Yes, yeah, she was sitting on the steps, and uh, I was playing football and whatnot. And so I went over, you know, talk with her and whatnot. And uh, that's where that was it. That was it. Fell in love and whatnot, and so that was it, you know. To just thank the Lord for her. Almost every week you're preaching. Almost. At almost. the local church, so. And, and teaching and doing the best I can. How long you been doing that? For many years. Got saved in 1959. Then a Bible study, teachings and so forth over the years, through the years. Yeah, I can't name them all. Can't name everything, but. Just thank the Lord, you see, that I'm going the way that the Lord would have me to go. What do you think about what's happening in the world right now? Oh, the world is in a de deplorable predicament. And uh, like my author said, that uh, it seems as though, though the Lord has forgotten all about our country, America. I'm talking about our country. Now. Right. Not about, but our country's in a terrible state, you see, and that's it. These, these people can't. They, they can't see Christ and they don't want the Lord to say they're saved, but yet they, they don't know Christ. And it's pitiful. So I just pray. The Lord tells me to pray. That's what I do. But we've got to continue to preach the gospel and to continue to instruct our children as best we can that the word of God is right. When the Lord said, if I be lifted up, up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. What's your favorite Bible passage? Oh, I like... Uh, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw the magnetic force of God. I will draw all men unto me. That's an interesting one. I might have to write that title down. The magnetic force of God. I haven't heard that that's one. What I, that's what I always say. You know, put that in there. <laughs> no, that's a good way to put it. I will draw all men yeah. unto me. Okay. Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in thy heart that God is raised from the dead. Thou shalt be saved according to the Bible. Did you ever want to give up? Did you ever, like, it was too much? No, I didn't want to give up because I had Christ on my side. He didn't give up. 
People want to have their own way, do their own thing. All I know to do is just continue to pray and preach. That's all I know until it comes. Lord, I want to live for Thee every day and hour. Let Thy Spirit go with Thee. Be Thy sacred power. That's it. What do you want to leave us with? What do you want to leave behind? What, what are some of the thoughts you would have if, if all the family was gathered here and you were just talking to us, kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, what would you say? I tell them to study the Word and allow the Spirit of God to lead you because without God's Spirit, a person is not saved. Or remember, if they're in the church or wherever, if they do not have God's Spirit in them, then they're not born again, their names are not written in the, in the Lamb's Book of Life, and they're not going to spend eternity with Christ. My greatest joy is, is to know that I have about, what, 23 great-grandchildren? 23 <laughs> great-grandchildren and one, one great-great-great-great-great-great-great-child. <laughs> two, two. Yeah, two, he said, yeah. Okay. So you got, you got plenty of so family. I got, I got a lot. <laughs> you can't even keep up with them all. No, I can't. That's Sean's piece. Yes, sir. Now generational. Yeah. So as you think of your own, our own families, we want to think of the generational impact yeah. of this kind of gathering. That we could have this gathering because of him. And uh, and uh, so I'm honored to be your son. But we will forever be grateful. That's a chorus. I want a little bit more. Huh? I want a little bit more. I'm want gonna to tell God <laughs> all about it one of these days. I'm going to tell God all about it one of these days. Just a short, short, short verse. That's all. Okay. You see, that's all we need. And, and, and unless I get my hymn book, and get a hymn book, then we can sing him. So Jesus is asleep. They wake him up. When they wake him up. He speaks to the circumstance that was causing the crisis. So don't let it be said your crisis continues because you never took the time to wake the Savior up. And so Jesus now turns to his disciples. Why are you afraid, verse 40, how is it that you have no faith? Why are you afraid? And why do you have no faith? Oh, I don't know, Jesus. Maybe it's because we're getting ready to die. Because <laughs> in verse 35, Jesus said, let us go to the other side. Not let me go to the other side. We're going to make it to the other side. You left shouting. You were excited to get in the boat with me. But when the circumstances showed up, they overrode what I said. In other words, your problem overrode my promise. So you were now living in light of the problem, no longer living in light of the promise. And when you live in light of the problem and no longer in light of the promise, the problem will dominate you and it will totally erase the fact I ever made one. God never wants your circumstances, he doesn't want you to deny them. A storm is a storm. You don't call it a sunshine day. A storm is reality. But he never wants your circumstance to trump his word. Not only does he not want your circumstance to trump his word, he doesn't want your circumstance to trump his presence. Because he's on the boat too. And so Jesus speaks to the problem, and when he speaks to the problem, there is a circumstantial change. Verse 41 says, they became very much afraid. When they were in the lilac, they were afraid. When they saw who they were dealing with, they became very much afraid. In other words, 
we're afraid of the wrong thing. <laughs> See, we let our circumstances scare us. He says, when you know who you're dealing with, <laughs> you'll be less afraid of that and more scared of me. Because shucks, if I, could tell the, if I could tell the storm to calm down, what could I do with you if I'm ticked off at you? I'll shut you out and shut you out of here. No, if you're going to be scared, then what you need to be is scared more. Your fear ought to be toward who I am, not what the circumstance is. Because once I get up, all I got to do is talk to it. I wonder if anybody here ever seen God talk to a situation. You know, it was out of your control. Nobody you knew you could help you. You didn't have money to buy your way out of it. And, and God said something. Heaven spoke to it and boom, suddenly, immediately, out of nowhere, that thing changed. So it's more important to, by faith, get Jesus dealing with the circumstance than you living in fear. Don't be scared of the wrong thing. When Jesus' is humanity, his sleep, his deity stays awake. Who then is this? They were on a journey of discovery. Trials, as inconvenient and as painful as they are, are a journey of discovery of who you're dealing with. See, because too many of us still got him in a manger somewhere. Too many of us, too many of us don't, don't know who we're dealing with here. I mean, he's tired, so he got to go to sleep because he's human. He gets up and he puts the lilac to sleep because he's God. Okay? Because you know, he's human. And we, we call this in theology the hypostatic union. The hypostatic union means two natures in one person unmixed forever. Two natures in one person unmixed forever. So he's both human and divine. See, so God fertilized the egg of a woman. He fertilized the egg of Mary without a male sperm so that the Holy Spirit would provide the divine and Mary would provide the human so that the human and the divine would be mixed in one person without sin forever. That's a hypostatic union. So, so one minute, he's thirsty, the Bible says. He said, I thirst. But the next minute, he's walking on water and, 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 and stopping storms and stuff. One minute, he says, I hunger. The next minute, he's taking sardines and crackers and making a folk Moby Dick sandwich to feed 5,000 men, not counting women and children, over 20,000 people. One moment, he died on a cross. Another moment, he raised folk from the dead. Come on, who are you? What manner of man is this? Hebrews 4 says, and we have a high priest who is able to sympathize with our pain. How can you sympathize with my pain? Because I'm human. So I can feel what you feel the way you felt it. But I'm divine. See, when I go to you or you go to me, that's human to human. I may be able to sympathize but not be able to fix it. But when you deal with the God man, you're dealing with someone who can feel it and fix it. See, if, you're, if your obstetrician is a man who's delivering your baby, he can fix it, but he can't understand it. Because your male obstetrician has never known what it's like to be pregnant, know what it's like to be in labor, and know what it's like to give birth. Now he can, he can fix it, but he can't feel it. But if your obstetrician is a female who also has children, they can feel it and fix it. Because they know what it feels like to be pregnant. They know what it feels like to be in labor. They know what it feels like to deliver. But because of their training, they know how to help you and know what it feels like while they help you. All a man can do is lie and say, I know how you feel. In fact, the next pregnant woman that has a baby and the doctor says, I know how you feel, say, stop lying, doctor. I ain't, I ain't here for your lies. You don't know how I feel. But a woman with a baby knows how you feel. But that training 
is enabling her to fix it. God says, because I'm a man, I know how you feel. But because I'm God, I can do something with it. What manner of man is this? That even the circumstances, nature obeys him. That nature has to succumb to him. So if you have a lilac, and if you don't have one, keep living. You will. God wants to take you to a place of understanding in him that you've never been before. Revelation 19. Beginning with verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire. And on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From its mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he will strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the wine press of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in mid-heaven, Come and assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized with him, the false prophet, who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. And now, Lord, as we anticipate the return of the Son of the living God, would you awaken us to this reality because of the accuracy of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Any of you who have watched the movie The Terminator with Arnold Schwarzenegger knows that one of the iconic phrases that has come out of that series of films is the phrase, I'll be back. That despite the chaos and the turmoil that he faced, in spite of the fact of him being melted he promised a return, that he would come back. When Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead, he stood on the mountain of Olives just outside of Jerusalem, and he told his disciples, I'm coming back. He said, I'm coming back to the same place from which you've seen me ascend. Jesus prophesied his second coming. As we continue in our series on prophecy today, I want to, as best as I can, recognize the limitation of time that I have to summarize for you the greatest and most epic event that will occur in human history. And that event is designated the second coming of Jesus Christ. It will be the most spectacular, the most dynamic, 
it will be the most jaw-dropping thing that has ever occurred in history that was real. Sony Pictures can't compete with it. Sci-fi will be embarrassed by it because this will be real. Jesus made it clear that if I, if I rise from the dead, then everything else must in fact be true. Of course, if Jesus has not risen from the dead, we shouldn't even be here today. But if, if the resurrection is true, then everything else he has prophesied is equally true. The second coming of Jesus Christ will come at the conclusion of an event. To understand and appreciate the second coming of Christ, you have to understand the event that leads up to it. You've all heard about it. You've seen movies about this event. This event is not unknown. It is recognized. It's used in common everyday lingo. It's called the Battle of Armageddon. The Battle of Armageddon will be the World War III, to put it in language we can relate to, that will lead to the second coming of Christ. And so to introduce the second coming, I need to talk about World War III that was prophesied in the scripture. The Battle of Armageddon is not one battle, it is a series of battles or a campaign, if you will, that will culminate in the second coming of Christ. Let me lay it out for you, show you a couple of key scriptures so that you can grasp it because there's so much to it that as best as I can, I want to summarize it for you. The tribulation is the seven-year period of time after the rapture of the church where God will reestablish his program with Israel. Now, the reason he must reestablish his program with Israel is because God's revelation was to come through Israel. His written and living revelation was to come through his sovereign choice of the nation Israel. Because of Israel's rejection of Messiah, God has placed them aside for the time being to work with the church. The church will be raptured, as we have seen, introducing the 70th week of Daniel or the last seven years of history as we now know it. There will be a peace treaty signed. We've already seen this by the Antichrist, and he will seem like the answer to the Middle East conflict. He will establish a peace treaty. This Antichrist will arise out of Europe, the ten toes of Daniel, overseeing the now already built European Confederacy, Confederation of, of Nations that now exist in Europe, where the Bible prophesied that there would be a common currency. It's now in place, the euro. And so the Antichrist will arise and he will be this peacemaker in the first half of the tribulation. Satan understands that to block the second coming of Christ, he's got to get rid of Israel. Because Israel is the one thing standing in the way of him nullifying the promises of God because God promised it would come through Israel. Israel has rejected him. Therefore, he must get rid of Israel so that they, they do not respond to him. And so when you get to this part of prophecy, Israel is on center stage. And the Middle East is on the front page. So let's bring it now to the middle of the tribulation. Those of you on Wednesday night have seen over and over again the, men, the mention of three and a half years or 42 months over and over and over again. That's called in the Bible the Great Tribulation, the last half of the seven-year period. 
During this period of time, the last three and a half years, something is going to occur. That something is summarized for us in Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 to 45. And I will summarize for you that for you now. Because this will occur as we come to the middle of the tribulation, which will set in motion Armageddon. The prophet Daniel prophesying about the Antichrist who is to come says in chapter 11, at the end of time, the king of the south will collide with him, the Antichrist, and the king of the north will storm against him with chariots, with horsemen, and with many ships. And he will enter countries, overflowing, overflow them, and pass through. He will also enter the beautiful land, Israel, and many countries will fall, but these will be rescued out of his hand. Verse 42, then he will stretch out his hand against other countries and the land of Egypt will not escape. But he will gain control over the hidden treasure and gold and silver and over the precious things of Egypt. Verse 44, but rumors from the east and from the north will disturb him and he will go forth with great wrath to destroy and annihilate many. Daniel now prophesying about the end time at the end of time says that there will be a reaction to the rise of the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to rise as this worldwide peacemaker and he will say like Hitler, today Europe, tomorrow the world. And he will lay claim to world rulership. The king of the north, Russia, and the communist bloc is going to react to that not wanting the Antichrist to rule and will attack the Antichrist. So you should not be surprised today when you open up the newspaper and see that Russia has now come to the aid of Syria joining Iran against Israel. He says there will now also be a reaction from the king of the south. That's Egypt and the Islamic contingency which is also against Israel. So Egypt, the Arab nations, and the religion of Islam is going to come against Israel and the Antichrist who has positioned himself initially as a friend of Israel. So you've got these two groups coming against the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to defeat them causing another army to come into the play. You read it, it's the army from the east. That's China. That's the eastern bloc, which seeing the power of the Antichrist and not wanting to be overruled, will move, the book of, Revel the book of Revelation says, with an army of 200 million strong to come up against the Antichrist who has set himself up to rule the whole world. So you got all of this stuff happening and it's all happening in one location, the Middle East. Look at Revelation chapter 16. Here's what we read, verse 13. And I saw out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet that is the unholy trinity, three unclean spirits like frogs. And they were spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. And they gather them together to the place which in Hebrew is called Armageddon, or the valley or the mountain of Armageddon. Armageddon is a huge plain. Napoleon Bonaparte, when he saw the valley, uh, the, uh, the valley of Megiddo, he said, this is the most natural battlefield in the world. It is huge. And it will be the staging area or central control for this 
battle where these armies are coming initially against the Antichrist. So that is a summary of what will set in motion this battle of Armageddon. Now, when all of this is taking place, God is not silent. Zechariah chapter 14 puts it this way. In describing the same battle through another prophet, and that's some of the challenge of this because it's scattered throughout the Bible, but verse 2 says, For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city will be captured, the houses plundered, the women ravaged, and half of the city exiled, but the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. The Lord will go forth and fight against those nations, and when he fights on the day of battle. So, let me explain this, Lucy. All these nations are coming together in the Middle East, because Satan has got to get rid of Israel. That's, that's his last hope for victory against God. But Zechariah says, God is bringing the nations together. But Revelation 16 says that the unholy trinity is bringing the nations together. So who's bringing the nations together? Both. Satan is doing it for his purposes and God is doing it for his purposes. So you have to understand something about God and that is God can use the devil to accomplish his purposes. Okay? There are many illustrations of that in the Bible but for our sake today, God is allowing the devil to be the devil in order to accomplish the will of God. So whenever you think of the devil, just remember he's God's devil. Okay? And so God is using the rebellion of Satan to accomplish his purposes. So now, the whole world is centered on the Middle East. When this happens, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, all of them are going to be talking about this. Some of you may ask, well, where is the United States in all of this? Well, remember, the Antichrist is over Europe. The military of Europe is NATO. The United States is the power and economic support for NATO. So when the Antichrist rises in Europe, the United States is swallowed in that because the United States supports the European Union. So we become, in fact, the United States was born out of Europe. So it's natural it would be the support for this European activity that takes place. So now you have the whole world centered in Israel. You have now the leaders of the nation of the world coming together initially against the Antichrist who begins to defeat some of them. And as we saw last time, in the midst of all of this, the Antichrist in the middle of the tribulation is going to break his agreement with Israel. It's called the abomination of desolation. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, he's going to come in and he's going to now try to destroy Israel. At the beginning of the tribulation, he was Israel's friend. Now, he becomes Israel's enemy. That's why in Revelation chapter 12, we read in, in uh, verse 13, and when I saw the dragon, he saw that he was thrown down to earth. He persecuted the woman, Israel, who gave birth to the male child, Jesus, and God has to protect Israel from the Antichrist decision to destroy them. So he provides this protection for Israel. We see in verse 15, and the serpent poured out water like a river out of his mouth after the woman, Israel, so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. He's trying to drown or destroy Israel. Because if he does not destroy Israel, he cannot keep Christ from coming back. And if Christ comes back, he's doomed. Now, this sermon is on the second coming of Christ. 
But you have to understand that we're setting the stage. And the stage is being set by all the world now coming together in the Middle East for the destruction of Israel. And the reason that they are doing that is because Satan has to stop the return of Christ by destroying Israel. Now with that backdrop, you ever been in a play? You're in a play and the screen is closed. And you know, you're talking because the play is not ready to start yet. And then the lights begin to dim. It begins to get a little darker and a little darker and a little darker. You know what that means? It means it's showtime. Turn to Matthew chapter 24. Let me show you showtime. Not at the Apollo, <laughs> but on planet Earth. Verse 29. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. And the moon will not give its light. And the stars will fall from the sky. And the powers of the heaven will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Okay, so if you're here, which means you weren't saved, because if you were saved, you wouldn't be here because you'd have been part of the rapture. So for all y'all that's going to be here, <laughs> let me describe what's going to happen. As these battles are being fought, first between the Antichrist and those who are coming against him, and then the Antichrist going against Israel, as all of this World War III stuff is occurring and news is being fed about it all around the world through, through media and through all of the technology that, that now we understand why God waited for the return of Christ because he wanted technology set in place so that what he prophesied could take place that people before the technology did not know was part of God's plan, but all of this is part of God's sovereign plan. And so what is going to happen is God is going to block the light of the sun. The darkness will begin to, to uh, uh, descend upon the earth because it's showtime. The Bible declares, and every eye will see him. When Jesus Christ makes his return, in some way, whether he loops around the sun so that in a, in a 24 hour period the whole world will see him because of the rotation of the earth on its axis or whether technology has become so sophisticated by then that it is seen by everybody whether on a, on a telephone or whether on an iPad or whether on a computer or whether on television, some kind of way God is going to give worldwide manifestation that the Son of God has arrived and that it's now showtime. Now you can dismiss this to sci-fi if you want to. But the declaration is clear that on this occasion, and in the words of the fight announcer, Jesus is coming and saying, let's get ready to rumble. He will make his descent from heaven into history. He will make his presence seen. And so the scripture says in Revelation 1, 7 and here in Matthew 24, 31, that the whole world will see this. As Jesus Christ manifests himself and as the scripture that we read in Revelation chapter 19 
He is going to descend, it says, on a white horse. Now, to appreciate this, you have to understand that that, he didn't, that wasn't just something made up. When a Roman general went out to defeat a nation in biblical times, he would always ride a white horse. The reason he rode a white horse is that was the horse of victory. So whenever you see a Roman general coming back from a victory, he's on a white horse to symbol the battle is over, the battle has been won, victory has been held. So when it says Jesus is coming back on a white horse, it says he's coming back victorious. He's coming to victory. Why? Because he has now gotten the whole world on, on the same page. It says he's going to call all of Israel back to Jerusalem. And in the midst of that, he will descend from heaven with eyes, verse, chapter 19, verse 12 says, a flame of fire. Now, let me explain this. This is not Jesus meek and mild. This is not sweet little Jesus boy. No. You have two ways you can relate to Jesus. You can relate to him on the cross where he's the savior. Or you can relate to him on the throne where he's the judge. Every parent or most parents have two sides to him. The gucci gucci goose side and I'm going to wear you outside, all right? We've already seen on Wednesday night, we've seen they refuse to repent. They refuse to repent. They even curse God in the book of Revelation. So at that point, Jesus is now coming back as judge to judge the world and their rejection of him as the son of the living God. And when he comes, his robe is dipped in blood, verse 13 says. His name is called the word of God. And the armies that are with him. Now that's where you and I come in. That's where you and I come in. You get a white horse. Okay? The armies that are with him, remember? We go with him in the rapture. We then go through the judgment seat of Christ where we are given rewards. We then get ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's next week. That's a, that's a big event. And we come with him. At the rapture, we go to him. At the second coming, we come back with him. Okay? The rapture, we're caught up. The second coming, he comes down. He does not come down to earth at the rapture. He comes down to earth at the second coming. At the second coming, the armies that are with him, those who are dressed in with, with, with the, uh, uh, the linen of, uh, of our redemption, come with him, verse 13, 14 says, on white horses. And in his mouth is a sharp sword that he might strike down the nations. So here's what's going to happen. The world has converged on the Antichrist. The Antichrist has had victory over many of those nations. The East comes because of what they've seen him do with the king of the North and the king of the South. In the middle of all this Armageddon confusion, Jesus Christ leaves heaven with the saints. He comes down and he makes his presence seen by the whole world. And according to Zechariah chapter 14, Verses 3 and 4, he lands on the Mount Olive, which is where he left, which is what the Bible says. He's coming back to the same place he left. It says when his feet hit the ground, the earth will split. It says there will be an earthquake when Jesus' feet hit the ground that will go all the way down to the Dead Sea. When his feet hit the ground on the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 14 says, he will speak with his mouth. One of the things he will say, do you, you remember Alfred Hitchcock, the birds? It says he will summon all the birds to come and get ready for supper because it's meal time. And through a spoken word out of his mouth, the Bible says he will speak the word and he will slay the nations. 
So this is not going to be a long battle. This, this, this part is real short. Those other things will last a number of years in the second half of the tribulation. But on this one, Jesus Christ will speak the word and he will summon in the most dramatic act of warfare in human history, he will bring about the slaughter of those who reject him. The Bible says when Jesus Christ does this, Zechariah 12.10 says, Israel will look at him on whom they pierced and they will repent and receive Jesus as Messiah or as Romans chapter 11 verse 26 says, and then all of Israel shall be saved. They will receive Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And when they receive him as their Messiah, the Old Testament promises will be fulfilled because Israel has to accept him before they can be fulfilled. God allows these events to occur to drive Israel to accepting him and then the Bible says Jesus Christ will set up his millennial kingdom, which is our discussion next week. The beast, verse 20, was seized. And with him the false prophet who performed the signs in the presence of him who deceived the folks with the mark of the beast. And they were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. So Jesus will defeat men, he will get the Antichrist, he will get the false prophet, they're cast into the lake of fire, and as you will see next week, he's got a special program for the devil. And you and I are with him. All those who come to Jesus Christ for salvation are with him. So what do we do with all of this? What, what, do we, what do we do with all this? There's so much. When Jesus comes back, he will come back as king of kings and lord of lords, he says. Today we got kings for everything. You got lion king. You got the king of soul, the king of pop, the king of swing, the king of the beast. You got king of rock and roll. But when Jesus comes back, it says with many diadems, that's a whole bunch of crowns. He's king of kings and lord of lords. And he will rule with a rod of iron. You will see a perfect dictatorship. The, the world will be under a dictator, but a righteous dictator, which is why he's called faithful and true. And Jesus Christ will set up his millennial kingdom. We'll go into details on that next week. And he will rule the world from Jerusalem. The whole world. And based on the rewards that you get, based on your life now, will determine how you will be positioned then. If you were a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, you will be highly positioned. If you were an unfaithful follower of Jesus Christ, you'll be a street sweeper. Now, you'll be singing while you sweep. <laughs> you know, because, you know, you, you're saved, so, so you're going to be a happy street sweeper. But you will be assigned a role based on your faithfulness now and your commitment to Jesus Christ now and your public confession of him now, that will determine the, the role you have. So that's why even though this, this Armageddon stuff does not directly apply to you, it directly applies to you because what you do now affects your role then when Jesus Christ returns. It also, as I mentioned a moment ago, or to give you a different perspective on the devil because what you need to understand is evil as he, as he is, he is limited now. He can't do to you all he wants to do to you because of what 2 Thessalonians calls the restrainer. 
holds him back. The Holy Spirit limits what he can do. That's why the scripture says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Because Satan right now is on a leash. When you have a dog on a leash, it can go somewhere, but only as far as the leash allows. In the tribulation, when the leash is extended, he will be able to do more. But right now, what he can do to you is lie. Trick you. Trick you in your thinking, trick you in your emotions. He can trick you to make you think he's bigger and badder than he really is, but he's so good at it. Have you ever met anybody that's a born liar? That means that mean they're real good at it because they've been doing it since they were a child. He's a born liar, and because he's the father of lies, the scripture says, he can make you believe you don't have victory, you can't have victory, you won't have victory, you are defeated, you, you know. He can do all that. He can really do it then, but he can do it now. But what God wants you to understand is that the devil at his best is his devil. And while the devil is trying to mess over you, God is doing something else. He's constructing something else. Paul said it this way. He said, we look through a glass darkly. We don't, we don't see things clearly. You, I got a watch, you have a watch, and I, I look at the face of my watch, so I can tell you the time, because I look at my face. But, but if you'd have asked me, give me the details of how all the parts work. I, I, can't, I can't explain that. All I know is, it's 920. I, I can tell you that much, but there are a whole lot of details in here that I can't explain, those little teeny parts and how they, they relate to one another. I can't explain all that. I can just tell you what time it is. And there's a whole lot, there's a whole lot of details. I've only touched the surface. All I can do is give you a summary. There's so many details in this thing through all the different prophets and all the different predictions. And all, the, I, all I've done, all I've done is shown you the time. Okay? Because that's, that's all I can do. Even after you study the book of Daniel, you study the book of Revelation, all I've done is shown you the time God has the parts and the details and how they all intersect and relate to one another and, and how, they all, how they all connect. But you know something? You really don't need to know how it all works. You need to know what time it is. So what I'm trying to tell you is what time it is. Yeah, all the details and, and all of the, in this country and Syria and Lebanon and Persia and all that, all of those are discussed. They're discussed in Ezekiel chapter 38, Ezekiel chapter 29, uh, 38 and 39, Gog and Magog, and, and, and it talks about Iran and that. And it's, all, that's, all that's in there. And, and, and I, 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 I get a headache. I get, I, I get depressed sitting down to prepare this stuff for y'all. I'm sitting in my study looking at all this stuff and reading all this stuff and I'm, I'm saying, let me, let me call Pastor Gibson and tell him preach because it's just, it's just too much stuff. But what I can tell you is what time it is. And uh, just in case you didn't know, it's getting late. Uh, that, that much I can tell you. So I know next week we're going to fall back, but eschatologically speaking, you better jump forward because it's, it's getting late. Who would have thought, who would have thought that after Russia broke down and broke up and disintegrated that, that, that it would be part of the prophetic scene overnight? reasserting itself as we back up and they move forward and the bear, Russia, now begins to ascend to take charge in the Middle East. Who would have thought that Iran would now emerge as a dominant influence over there? Who would have thought that overnight ISIS would arise in the midst of that? Who would have thought all of this would occur? The reason why you must take prophecy serious is God has already seen the future and come back to notify us about it. And
and it says Israel will look on him on whom they pierced. They said, crucify him, crucify him. You and I will be with him. Everyone who's come to faith in Christ will be with him. You will never mistake him. He will stand out in the crowd. Because Jesus Christ will be the only scarred person. You will have a perfectly new glorified body. You will be the same race that you are. You will be the same gender that you are. You will, you will simply be perfect humanity. At your most perfect age, which I take to be 33. <laughs> now, I didn't make that up. I got that from the, 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 the life age of Jesus Christ. Adam, remember, and Eve were created as adults. They weren't created as kids. So you will be your perfect self. But there will be a scarred one. For they will look on him who they pierced. When Jesus arose from the dead, Thomas said, unless I see the nail prints in his hand and the scar in his side, I will not believe. Jesus came to Thomas after he rose from the dead and said, see these nails? See this scar? Thomas touched them. So you'll never confuse who your savior is because from the time you meet him at the rapture all the way through the millennium into eternity, those will be the eternal reminders that you're saved by these scars, you're delivered by this scar, you're delivered by these scars, the nail prints in his hand, the scar in his side, the nail prints in his feet, so that when I meet you at the corner of Gold Street and Silver Boulevard, we will be giving praise to the Savior who loved us, gave his life for us, saved us, raptured us, redeemed us, returned with us, and given us eternal life with him. And that makes him worthy of praise. Let's stand to our feet. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, no one moving, we're going to close in a moment. But if you need to come to the Savior, I don't mean come to church, I don't mean be religious, I'm talking about something else. I'm talking about giving your life to Jesus Christ, who is the center of God's story. And you want to meet him as Savior, not as judge. Would you slip out of your seat and come down and let me pray with you as you make this decision? to either come to Christ or get right with Christ. Anybody need to make that decision? Yeah, that life is not a playground, but a battleground. When you've lived long enough, you've come to realize that life is not always easy. And while we cherish those times of fun and frivolity and play and excitement, we dread those times of pain and anguish and struggle. Someone has said that life can be described as being bittersweet. It has those sweet moments that we cherish and embrace and those bitter moments that bring us to tears, hurt, and pain. Paul is writing. And he concludes his treaties to the church at Ephesus to talk to them about the battleground of life. We call it spiritual warfare. But he's not just talking about any kind of battle. He describes this one specifically by calling it the evil day. The evil day. The evil day is when all hell breaks loose on you. The evil day is when you are overwhelmed. Yes, life has its normal ups and downs, 
But that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about when you are under major attack, when your world is being shattered, your dreams are being destroyed, your hopes are being dimmed, and where you look out and all you see is the light of an oncoming train. He calls that the evil day, the day when hell is after you and your name has come up. He says, when that day comes, when that period of time, when you're under major assault comes, he says, I want you to understand how to, how to approach this. Because he says, on that day, you're going to need the strength of the Lord, verse 10. Normal stuff is not gonna work. And playing church, show sure enough won't work. He says, on that day, you're going to need the supernatural. And so he goes into these verses leading up to the subject of prayer to tell us how to approach this time in your life, in my life. Now, I want to make sure that I'm not wasting my time on this sermon. So does anybody here know what I'm talking about when I talk about an evil day? An evil day. When you're under massive spiritual assault. Well, let me remind you that everything visible and physical is preceded by that which is invisible and spiritual. Everything visible and physical is preceded by that which is invisible and spiritual. So Paul wants you to know if you want to address in the time of your attack the visible and physical, you need to do it from the perspective of the invisible and spiritual. He gives you the term that he uses throughout the book of Ephesians of heavenly places. Heavenly places means the spiritual realm. And what he's saying is that when you are under assault, when your life is being shattered, you're trying to be in the will of God, you're trying to walk with God, but you're being attacked. Your well-being is being attacked. Your dreams are being attacked. Your health is being attacked. Your stability is being attacked. Your resources are being attacked. Your future is being attacked. You are just under assault. He says, during those times, you have to view things from the location of heavenly places or the spiritual realm if you're going to be strong to walk through, work through the times of those attacks. And he wants to set the plan in place for how you're going to make it through the evil day. For those of you who've not yet been to the evil day, keep living, it's coming. When you're under assault and your stability, your world is being shaken. He says during those times, three times he says, I want you to stand firm, stand firm, stand firm. Don't quit, don't quit, don't quit. Because the temptation is easily to throw in the towel when your world is collapsing right in front of your eyes. He says the first thing I want you to understand is that you wrestle not against flesh and blood. In other words, people aren't the source of your problem. They may be the conduit for your problem, but they're not the source of your problem. For we Christians wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and world forces that are located in heavenly places or the spiritual realm. So if you address the resource without addressing the source, all you've done is created a delay for it to come back up again because you've not gotten to the root of the problem. We're just addressing the fruit of the problem. And so what he is saying is the source is spiritual. He first of all wants to set the stage by saying on the evil day, when you're in this season of attack, I want you to stand firm, which means to hold your ground 
in the Lord. He says, be strong in the Lord. To hold your spiritual ground. It is easy to be swayed and moved off of center when you're suffering. It is easy to be swayed and moved off of the source of your hope when you're going through it and you see no exit sign. It is easy to be moved. But he says during those times when you are under assault and your world is being stripped from right underneath you, he calls it the evil day. He says, during that time, I want you to grab more tightly your faith. Don't loosen it up. Stand firm. When you're under the fire of the evil one, when you're under fire of demonic attack, when you're under the fire of suffering, you do not run away from God when you are in the evil day. You have to run to God when you're in the midst of the evil day because you're now engaged in spiritual warfare. He says, stand firm, hold on to your faith. He then tells you how to dress for spiritual success. He gives you the armor of God. He tells you, I want you to get dressed for the battle. Now when you're in a war and when you're in a parade, a military parade, they show the weapons. When you're in a war, you use the weapons. Because in the evil day, this is not showtime at the Apollo. This is time when you've got to get dressed. He says you've got to put on truth, put on righteousness, put on peace. He goes on, he says you've got to put on faith. He says you've got to put on the helmet of salvation. Then he says you've got to use the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. He gives these six pieces of spiritual arsenal or spiritual armor that the believer is to utilize when it comes to taking a stand in the evil day or when you're under spiritual attack and spiritual oppression that's affecting your physical, financial, circumstantial, emotional, family, well-being. Take your stand harder than you've ever taken it before, but put on this armor. But now you may not remember all the pieces of the armor. So let's make it easy because Romans chapter 13 verse 14 says, put on Christ. If you can't remember all the pieces, remember this one, put on Christ. Why? Because he says, I want you to be put on truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. He says, I want you to put on righteousness. Scripture says Christ is our righteousness. He says put on peace. Jesus said in this world you will have tribulation, but I give you my peace. He says put on the helmet of salvation. Scripture is clear, Jesus is the author and finisher of our salvation. And then he says put on the word of God, use the sword of the spirit. John 1.1 1, 1 says in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus says he is the word. So if you don't remember truth, remember Jesus. If you don't remember righteousness, remember Jesus. If you don't remember peace, remember Jesus. You put on Christ, you become centered in him. This is not belief in God. This is centered in God's son, who is the revelation of God, the manifestation of God, who is the power of God to manifest himself, particularly in the evil day. Now you want to do it all the time, but you better do it in the evil day. When the doctors don't have answers, when the bankers don't have answers, when your friends don't have answers, and show enough when you don't have answers. You need to be centered on the person of Jesus Christ and all the tools that he offers you. But he says, you gotta put him on. The question is, how do you put him on? That's where verse 18 comes in. Let me read it again. He says in verse 18, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. The way you put on Christ, that is 
practically utilize him to equip you to move through the battle you face is with prayer. Now, prayer is relational communication with God. A lot of people want to pray when they're in spiritual warfare who have not prayed till they got the spiritual warfare. In other words, they don't know how to stand strong in the Lord because they haven't been standing with the Lord. But now that they're in an emergency, they need the Lord. He's talking about staying in touch with him all day. That's why 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. In other words, stay in touch with me. Now let me explain why this is so important. The evil day is principalities, powers, and world forces. This means you are under attack. This means that this attack is coming from the devil and demons. It is unfortunate that far too many Christians have lost sight of demons. Demons are angels that went rogue. Demons are the spiritual mafia that attacks us in the spiritual that brings about our pain in the physical. And the Bible has an answer to demons. The answer to demons are angels. So here's how this works. The Bible declares every Christian has been assigned an angel. And the job of the angel is to look after the well-being of the believer. So every Christian has an angel that is assigned to you by God. One of the jobs of your angel is to thwart the demonic attack that is coming against you because angels know how to fight angels. And so when the demonic angel comes to bring pain and anguish and defeat in your world and in your life, you have an angel. The Bible says when we pray, we engage God, the Holy Spirit, and I'll talk about him in a moment, who, is, who activates the angel assigned to you to deal with the demonic oppression that is coming against you. So he says with all perseverance, but he tells you something else and it's the key. He says, pray in the spirit. Verse 18, uh, don't just pray, meaning don't just have conversation, but he says, I want you to pray in the spirit. Uh, the question is, what does that mean? The Bible talks about the role of the Spirit is to deliver the mind of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. But just as it is written, things which I have not seen and ear hath not heard and which has not been entered into the heart of man all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us, God revealed them. He's not talking about heaven, he's talking about earth. To us, God revealed them through the spirit. For the spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. See, when you're in the evil day, that means folk can't help you. When you're in the evil day, they have limitations that they can do for you. And you need something that I have not seen ear hath not heard, and the imagination is not conceived of. You need the supernatural to enter into the natural. Now, being in the spirit is opposed in scripture to being in the flesh. To be in the spirit, let me start with uh, the participle in. He wants you to be in the spirit. So he does not want you visiting and exiting. He wants you operating in the realm of the spirit. What is the realm of the spirit? The realm of the spirit is a spiritual mindset. 
In Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 13, he gives this extended discussion about the Spirit. And he says, when you have the Spirit, you have the mind of the Spirit. So this has to do with how you're thinking. The mind is your thought. He wants you to think spiritually, not secularly. He wants you to think biblically, not worldly. He wants you to think the mind of Christ, not the mind of man. Galatians 5, verse 16, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit and the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. He says there is a battle, and it's a battle between the spirit and the flesh. Let me define the flesh. The flesh is the desire to please self independently of God. The flesh is the desire to please yourself as opposed to pleasing God. We all battle with the flesh. Walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the desire. Please don't misread that. He didn't say you won't have the desire because the flesh wants what it wants. So you will have the desire, but the spirit will override it. Don't read the verse in reverse. Don't read to get rid of the desire of the flesh, walk in the spirit. That's backwards. Walk in the spirit and it will overrule the desire of the flesh. It will overrule it. The capacity to do what you need to do or what God wants done will be activated in your experience as you walk in the spirit. Now, many times people will say, I'm praying, but nothing is happening. Well, let me explain. Many Christians pray. They're doing the right thing, but they're doing it in the flesh. They're doing it in the wrong environment. And if you're doing the right thing in the wrong environment, the right thing won't work. So just because you say your prayers in the morning, say grace at dinner, and say your bedtime prayer, that's the right thing. But the question is, have you been walking in the right environment? Because if you're not walking in the right environment, doing the right thing won't work. And in fact, it can help kill you quicker. So he says, all, 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 I want you to be consumed with being in my presence, walking in the flesh, he says, will put you in a spiritual graveyard, but walking by the spirit will put you, and here's how you know, because you're no longer having to force things. When you're in the spirit, but the Bible calls the spirit a wind. A wind, it blows. The Bible says the Holy Spirit guides us. He pulls us. Now you can walk, you should walk, but you're walking on some power. You're walking on some undergirding. You're walking on some strength because you're walking with the mind of the Spirit consistent with the revelation and word of God so that he can override. And so you begin to flow in it even though you still have to walk. And even though you may have a ways to go, he says, pray always in the spirit, spiritually. And so he's my only out. And so we cry out to God and trust God. But you have your evil day. Well, you will. And if we make prayer a lifestyle Walking in the spirit, a lifestyle and not a visit. Don't treat the spirit like you treat church. Don't just come for a visit. No, he says, you roll with me and you stay in contact with me all day, every day, short, long, fast, slow. When we contact God, if the timing is wrong, he'll say slow. If the request is wrong, he'll say no. If we are wrong, he'll say grow. But if the request is right, the time is right, and we are right, sooner or later, he'll say go. So I want this to be known as a house of prayer. Praise God for great music. Praise God for preaching. All of that's critical to worship. But if we don't make contact with heaven, all we did was come to an event, a religious event. 
But if we as a church will cry out to God, 